Welcome to the second installment of the statistics part of this course. And today we're going to talk about the, the sort of primitive elements of hypothesis testing as they were discovered. And the story is actually interesting. Um, the idea is that we have a woman who claims that she can taste the difference in her tea between when the milk is added first and then the tea is poured in versus when the tea is poured in first and then the milk is added. And her name is Dr. Muriel Bristol. It's a true story. And it inspired Ron Fisher to, uh, Ronald Fisher, the godfather of statistics, to design the null hypothesis, which is, which is a pivotal, which is the key to modern uh, statistical hypothesis tests. So let's talk about the story. So, so there's a couple of things that could be true here, right? She could be guessing at a 50-50 uh, probability and, and get these right, which is what Fisher thought. Like, how can you tell the difference um, between which was closer gravitationally to the center of the earth, the milk or the tea, when they start combining? So they propose a taste test and, and they're going to see if Muriel can actually do this. They're going to serve her eight cups of tea. Now in the original experiment, she knew that four of them would have milk added first and four of them would have tea added first. Now we're changing that experiment slightly uh, to go better with our course topics, but the probabilities um, are close. And so, and, and I've got some links in the our studio document um, that, you know, the HTML version that's online, and you can check out the, the exact story if you'd like to. But basically, if they just flip a coin and heads is milk first and tails is tea first, and they just serve her eight cups of tea and six, seven, or all eight of them could have the milk first uh, or vice versa, and then let her taste and let her say whether the milk or tea was added first. And if you do that, then, and she is able to answer seven or more correctly, then Fisher said that that would be good evidence. And let's see why, okay? But first let's talk about this null hypothesis idea. Null the null hypothesis is a claim about probabilities. Fisher's claim was that we needed evidence. She wasn't just blindly guessing and had a 50-50 chance of getting each one right. So if we need evidence that she's not guessing at 50-50, what we do, our null hypothesis is, suppose she does guess with 50-50 chance of getting it right. Now we have probabilities we can calculate. So we calculate the probabilities and we have two ways of doing that. We can either do it empirically or we can do it theoretically. We'll talk about both of those, especially in the RStudio portion. But we have a claim about probabilities but it's, we're not trying to prove it. This is why it's called a null hypothesis. We're trying to nullify it or disprove it. So the hypothesis, the null hypothesis is she's guessing at random 50-50 chance. We're going to collect data and compare it to these probabilities and see if we have evidence for something different. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a probability density function for this probability experiment. And then the question is, we're going to calculate these probabilities to decide whether or not we would believe her claim. So a couple of big ideas here. It's going to be important to remember that the null hypothesis is always going to specify a probability model. Every null hypothesis we have does this. As we've said, the null hypothesis for the lady tasting tea is random guessing. Now this was added later. This was not part of Fisher's original idea, but it has become that way in the 100 or year, 190 to 100 years since then. The idea of an alternative hypothesis, we usually state what's probably true if we do nullify the null hypothesis. Right, so in our lady tasting tea example, if Dr. Bristol um, was able to identify seven or more cups, what would that mean? It would mean that the probability that the null hypothesis was actually true would be really, really low. If the probability of truth is low, 
we have evidence that it's false. And then Fisher would be convinced she was actually able to tell which had been added first, the tea or the milk. So a probability-based statistics test is going to compare empirical or theoretical probabilities to the actual results, right? When we calculate this theoretical or empirical probability, right, it's called a p-value, right? So now we have a probability, we have a p-value, we collect the data from the experiment, and now we've got something to compare and contrast. If the probability the null is true is really, really, really low, then we're like, no, the null hypothesis doesn't appear to be true. We appear to have evidence for the alternative. One final thing, when we have a small p-value, when the probability the null hypothesis is true is very, very small, we say we reject the null. And that statistics terminology, reject the null. And what we mean is we ran a probability experiment and found the p-value to be tiny. It's really unlikely that the null is true, so we're going to reject it because these data we collected don't match what the probabilities in the null hypothesis predicted. So let's pull up the R document. Um, so here's the, the work um, with some links in it that you can check out. Um, and this goes through the experiment design. And we've got the probabilities here that Muriel would guess all eight correct. And you can see that it's less than 1% chance that would happen. And so what I like you to do with these, um, with these documents is take these code snips, right? And you can, it's a PDF, so, I mean, excuse me, it's HTML, so you can uh, copy it. I'll do that with the right click so you can see what I'm doing. And then I can come in here, and what I'm doing is I'm going to file, new file, our notebook. Okay, now all of this junk down here is, is just that, it's junk. Um, so here, I'll type in my R notebook, and then I can insert some R code, and now I'm just gonna paste, right? Maybe I should show you with the right click. I'm just doing paste there, and I'm going to take the require mosaic uh, the little hashtag, let me, let me show that. So the hashtag with no space um, is the comment. So right now, require mosaic is a comment. I don't know if mosaic is on in my uh, system right now. So I'm going to run um, require mosaic. And now that mosaic is on, I can recomment it and run it. Okay. And what does rflip8 do? Well, it flipped eight coins and you can see the results right here. So, so that's the first thing. Let's go grab another code snip uh, from the document. So here we go. Um, now we're going to do it a thousand times. And how are we going to do it a thousand times? Well, we have a do command in Mosaic. All right. And then we're going to tally it to show how many of those came out um, in what way. So here we go. Just copy, come over here, paste, hit the little play button. Now it's going to take a little while to flip these eight coins a thousand times, but that was a second and a half or so, you know, that wasn't too long. And notice, right, so we flipped the coin 10,000 times, only 29 out of 10,000 of those um, turned out uh, to be eight exactly and then you get a little more if you say well what if she gets what's the probability she gets seven or better well the probability of seven or more is i would add the 330 and the 30 and get about 360. so she'd have about a three and a half percent 3.6 percent chance that's what we mean by estimating these probabilities empirically when you just randomize the coin flips and just do 10,000 or 50,000 trials 
and then you just collect the results, this is a way to estimate the coin flip probabilities empirically. Okay, there's another way, and, and the uh, RStudio document, go all the way through it and, uh, and practice the R code, and you'll find out about that. So when, let's just talk about modern statistical hypothesis testing, because that's gonna take up the rest of this course. We need to identify the correct procedure. So there are different statistics procedures. They have different verification processes. So we always wanna let, we're thinking of ourselves as researchers and we wanna let the readers of our research report know exactly what we've done. And they have to know which procedure we've done because they might wanna rerun our results and make sure and, and verify them, for example. Uh, or they might wanna validate our experiment uh, by running a similar experiment of their own. So we need to tell them the correct procedure. We need to set up the correct null and alternative hypotheses. And these will mainly be symbols and those will be shown both in the uh, video lectures and in the RStudio documents going forward. I said this word earlier, but let me emphasize that every single statistical procedure has some kind of verification process that tests whether or not the data are appropriate for the procedure. If it fails, right, it says the data are inappropriate for the procedure, we stop, we can't use it. Now, in a basic statistics course, you're kind of stuck. That's why we have advanced statistics courses because we have developed statistical tests for a lot of niche situations where, you know, our standard basic intro to stats kind of procedures don't work but we're not gonna bore you with those details right now. Okay, so the, the next step, we wanna make sure that we set alpha. And by the way, a lot of people don't know how to set alpha and it's fine to just use alpha as 0.05 as your default. By the way, alpha is, is the level of significance. So we either say the level of significance is 0.05 or we say alpha is 0.05. Hopefully by the end of this course, you'll understand why we might set alpha in a different way. But 0.05 is the default if you don't know anything else. And then we're going to calculate this p-value and we can do it with, in lots of different ways. There are various stats apps out there on the web. There are stats packages that are in common use in lots of universities like SPSS, SAS, Jump, Minitab. Uh, we're gonna use R and RStudio. And we can even be the stats app ourselves and we can calculate these things by hand. After we've calculated a p-value, we're going to reach our statistical conclusion based on the p-value. So the p-value, remember, is the probability that this null hypothesis is true, right? The null hypothesis specifies the probability model. The p-value is the comparison between the data we have and the model. So when the p-value is really small, that indicates that the null hypothesis is very unlikely to be true. If not, if the p-value is like 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.2, right, 20%, 40%, 30% chance, well, we're not going to have any evidence that the null hypothesis is false. We're not going to be able to reject it. And then that's our conclusion. If the p-value indicates that the null is unlikely to be true, our statistical conclusion is to reject the null. If we don't have a small p-value, if the p-value doesn't indicate that it's unlikely to be true, we fail to reject the null. We don't accept the null, right? Because remember the logic Fisher put forward, it's a non-provable hypothesis. The null hypothesis can't be proven, so we can't say we accept the null. What we do is sort of this double negative, we fail to reject the null. We didn't find evidence to disprove the null. We didn't nullify the original probability assumptions. All right, so check out the RStudio uh, work for module two and good luck on your content quiz.